everyone. How are y'all doing today? Great. It's great to see all y'all here. It's great to see everybody that's joining join us online. And if you're going to watch later this week, welcome. Welcome to C1. We're excited to have you. We're in a, we're in a, new, a series called Redemption Culture. It is so neat to see how God is such a redeeming God, where, where we, especially since we live in a society, and, and not even just in, in our country, but the entire world, you do something wrong, and that's supposed to define you for your entire life. And God says, no, that's not it. What, that wrong thing you did, you can use that to win other people to Christ, and it is not a defining factor. God is such a redeeming God, and I'm so excited that this, that this series is, is going on. It's, it's so cool. Um, if, you, if you have an opportunity, check out our website. Check out um, our, the blog post for it. And if you want to contribute to the blog later on, at, online or if you're here in person, just reach out to us. It's an exciting thing that we're getting to offer out there as well. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube as well. We're excited to, to have those also. Guys, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to pray real quick, and we're going to jump into a time of worship. I think these guys got something really good for us today. God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. Thank you for everything that you're going to do today. Thank you for what you're going to do this week for us, Lord. And thank you for the word that you're going to have spoken to us today. And thank you for being here among us and allowing us to, to feel your presence, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us, please? We're going to worship the Lord together this morning.
to welcome him in this moment.
sections there's different needs represented and, and I'm just going to take and pray but as we're praying I want you to call out the need that's in your life we're talking about prayer this morning and there's power in the name of Jesus and so we're going to exercise the word of God and we're going to hold God to his word his word is true, and I believe the Holy Spirit loves it when we hold him in faith to his word. So I want you, I want you to declare that stronghold. I want you to declare that need, the healing, the, the whatever. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's physical, maybe it's emotional. Declare it and declare Jesus over it. God, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus for every person that's represented here, Lord, and every need. Lord, there are people here that need a physical healing. I pray right now over healing over them. Lord, I believe there's someone here that has an issue with their left foot. Lord, I pray right now healing over that left foot right now in the name of Jesus. I pray right now, Father, for, for every person that is bound to addiction right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I bind that stronghold in the name of Jesus, Lord. When we, we take captive every thought, every lie that sets itself up against your knowledge, and we make it obedient to you in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that you are more than enough. I thank you that you are the conquering king. I thank you that you are the lion of the tribe of Judah, that your word is true. Lord, I thank you that you are our healer. I thank you that you are our peace. I thank you that you are our strength. I thank you that you are our victory. So Lord Jesus, the areas of our life that does not sound like that, I command in the name of Jesus to come in line with the word of God. And I pray right now that where there's anxiety, I release peace. Where there's depression, I release joy. Where there is a need for healing, I pray complete and whole healing right now in the name of Jesus. Where there is lack, I release enough right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that your word is true. I thank you that you hear us. I thank you that you invite us to pray. I thank you that you are enough. In the name of of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. God is so good. <laughs> all the time, all the time. We're in the middle of a series called Redemption Culture. And it's made me really think about God's redemption. Like, we throw that word around, right? Redemption in church, like it's candy. But when you really think about the redeeming power of the Most High God, it is mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. He can turn anything around. He can move any mountain. And redemption doesn't just mean that he, um, the, by definition, it means that he wipes the slate clean. That's how thorough, and mighty the redemption of God is. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter what you've sinned. It doesn't matter. When God redeems, he redeems completely 
There's nothing beyond, no one beyond his redemption. And today I want to talk to you from this idea of redeemed conversation. Because when Jesus died, he restored to us relationship with the Most High God and restored this relationship and not just he's God, we're us. There is that. We should always keep that in our mind. But it's more than that. The Bible says that he put his spirit in us, that through his spirit, we can cry, Abba. We cry out to God the Father as our Father. In fact, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, when you pray, you should pray like this, our Father. And Romans 8 tells us that we are co-heirs with Christ. Well, Jesus constantly said, my father, my father. Like, Jesus is our older brother. If we are in Christ, Jesus is our older brother. We're adopted into the family of God. He is our father. And with a father comes conversation. One of the joys in my life every day, I call my dad. Sometimes I wake him up just to annoy him. Um... I barely, he's always up before me, but I, I like to talk to my dad. I love to just have conversation with him. And our father in heaven is no different because he's a doting, loving father. But we call this conversation prayer. We pray. And we, we've, we've talked about prayer before. And the proper way to pray is we, we pray to the Father through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of us, we pray wrong. <laughs> we pray to Jesus. And you can talk to Jesus. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with talking to Jesus. You can praise Jesus, thank Jesus. But Jesus died to restore relationship with the Father. And he even tells us to pray to the Father. There are times when I talk to Jesus and I ask Jesus some stuff. But we're, the majority of the time when I pray, I, I pray, Father, I, I need you. I remember one time I was running outside and um, I fell right in front of the, our, our window and I scraped my knees so bad and I just cried out, Daddy! I've never seen my dad run so fast he ran to me and scooped me up, and he just carried me inside. And, you know, you would have thought I lost my leg. <laughs> it was a scratch. But we are in a season where we have got to be a people of powerful prayers. Faith-filled prayers. We need to be praying prayers that look crazy unless God does something about it. That's how big our prayers need to be. Right now, the enemy is, he is manifesting himself, and he's not even hiding it anymore. One of the things we need to be praying, we need to be praying for our Supreme Court justices, that they keep their nerve, and they overturn this demonic ruling. We need to be praying that as a church. How do we go to war? We don't hold up picket signs. We don't hold up... Um, we don't protest outside people's houses. We get down on our knees and we go to war for justice. The Bible says, seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. We don't, we love people. Remember last week, everything we do is motivated by love. But we got to be praying prayers filled with faith. Praying prayers that, that change the course of history. It's really humbling when you think about prayer and what it is. God chooses to interact with this world through his people's prayer. And the church doesn't pray. If the church doesn't make a stand, if the church doesn't get down on our knees and go to war in prayer, who will? You know, Hindus pray. Muslims pray seven times a day. To emptiness. To no one. Their gods don't hear them, nor will they do anything for them. But Christians, the average pastor prays three minutes a day. And the average Christian prays 90 seconds a day. Be above average. Go to war. 
I want to read some scripture. We're going to go through a lot of scripture, and, and I want to reinforce something. I want to reinforce something. God loves you. And he wants us to pray. And so we're going to, we're going to launch with, with this barrage of scripture. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, or not. It might be, let's just go, just throw it up on the screen. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will get. So Jesus is, is talking to his disciples. They came to him and he said, listen, listen, I'm going to teach you how to pray. But I don't want you to model the patterns and behaviors of the world. The Pharisees and the rabbis of the day, they would go and they would just stand and they would chant and they would kind of move back and forth and they, they would declare scripture and they would be repetitive. They would say the same things over and over and over and over and over. And, and he's saying, and they would do it in public. They would have like the scripture on their forehead. They would have it on the wrist. They, they, and, and, and they would kind of make a show of it. And, and Jesus is saying, that's, that's powerless prayer. You're making it about you and not about God, who you're praying to. And he's saying, and, and, and the people who admire these spiritual people that pray publicly and make it all about them, he says that's all the reward they'll get. Let's keep going. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Will reward you. It doesn't say he might reward you. It says he will reward you. And then let's go to the next scripture. Then when you pray, don't babble on and on as other religious people do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again and again. This is still happens in religions around the world. This still happens. It's, it happened way back then. There, because here's the thing. You can start talking and mindlessly talk and not, and not engage your brain. Husbands have been doing this for years. Yes, dear. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yes, dear. Whatever you want. God doesn't want that. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need before you even ask him. So he tells us right after that. And we're not gonna, it's not on the screen, but he says that, that that's, that's when we get the Lord's Prayer, which I think is a horrible title for that. Because it says, forgive us our sins. Jesus never needed to ask forgiveness. I think that's our prayer. He gave us a template for prayer. It starts with praise and it ends with praise. And in between, he asks for provision. He asks for the power to resist temptation. Like, he, he, helped, he asks that we forgive as God forgives. I mean, like, it's... There's a template for prayer there. And what's ironic about the Lord's Prayer is that some people turn around. And there's, listen, there's nothing wrong with praying the Lord's Prayer. If you get up and you say the Lord's Prayer, but mean it. Let, when you say it, let it be something that resonates in your heart and your soul. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Let it be a true prayer. Don't just go through our fathers, our Father who art in heaven. You know, like... Go through the motions of it. And that's what Jesus was getting at. Don't go through the motions of prayer because you are praying to a God who loves you and that is listening. If you did that, if you went through the motions of relationship with anyone else, you wouldn't be in that relationship long. They'd be like, I don't want to be around them. They don't care for me. This is not in your on the screen, but it's Ephesians 3.20. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. It's pretty amazing. Because of Christ, when we pray, we can come boldly and confidently into his presence. Ephesians 6.18, it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers 
and request. God's, God's saying, just do it. And then we're going to pick up in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. He's saying, pray. Let's go to the next one. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. That's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty powerful statement. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Let's go. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Let's keep going. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through, 8, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus for you. Let's keep going. It keeps getting better. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit prays for us when we can't even pray for ourselves through us. James 5 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Luke eleven nine, 9. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me, and I will answer you. And will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Jeremiah 29. It's not on the screen, but... I think it's 29.12. He says, seek me and you will find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. There's this, there's this inv invitation. And, and, and so I just want to give you three thoughts today about prayer. And uh, I want to say this is a praying church. And even today, I got testimony. Um, we, there was a young, young man in Missouri that was in a horrible car accident. And um, he had internal bleeding. We sent out a prayer request. And... Man, like within 48 hours, they, they, they thought he was going to die. He had like bleeding on the brain, internal hemorrhaging, all the, um, he was in rough shape. Within 48 hours, he's at home. Praise God. There's power in prayer. The, like doctors were dumbfounded because there's power in prayer. This is a praying church, but I, 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 I really feel, as I was praying, man, the last three weeks, the Lord has shifted my message. Shifted my message. As like, I walk into thinking I'm going to preach this this week, and then I walk out after praying, and I'm like, the Lord's telling me, tell my people to pray. Tell my people to pray. I think there might be a necessity right now in our culture that's a cancel culture that God's saying, I want to redeem this conversation we're not operating in the power that we have that he makes available because we don't think we're worthy. There's any number of excuses, but God wants to change history through the church, a praying church. And we are a praying church, but we need to be reminded. So the first thought I want to leave you is God invites us and wants to converse with us. Prayer is a conversation. God wants us to pray. We just read like 10, 10 scriptures, 11 scriptures about prayer. And it's this, pray always. Pray without ceasing. Ask whatever you, you know, like God, Jesus said four times in three chapters at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the book of John. He says, ask anything in my name and it will be given to you. Like he invites us to pray. He wants us to pray. He loves communion with us. He loves to have conversation with us. He loves it. 
It's mind-blowing. We are designed. I want you to hear this. We are designed by God to converse with God. We are designed by God to have answered prayers from God. God did not give us the assignment and ministry to pray to keep us occupied until he returns. Oh, man, what what am I going to tell them to do? Oh, let's just tell them to pray. That way they're just going to be praying all the time with no results. God didn't do that. He gave us some ministry and the assignment to pray with the intention of changing the world. When you really think about what prayer is, God chooses to exact his will on earth through the prayer of the saints. That's how powerful prayer is. You think, oh, my prayers don't make a difference. It could change the course of history. Your prayers make a difference. Your prayer might be the reason why that person gets healed of cancer. Your prayer might raise the dead. Your prayer might set that family financially free. Your prayer. Know why? Because we are, in, we, are, we are having conversation with a limitless, omnipotent, omnipresent God who says, I want to interact with my church through prayer. It's quite humbling. It's so humbling. When you think about, why does God choose to use someone like me or you? He could have used the rocks and the, in, in, in the gravel out front. But he chose to interact, to exact his will on earth through his people when he calls us to prayer. You know what's even more mind-blowing about prayer? Is we are co-laboring with God. <laughs> co-laboring. He invites us to come along beside him. He invites us to walk beside him and say, you know what? I'm actually going to not do something until my people pray. And he waits patiently because he invites us to come along beside him and work with him. Like, I want to work through my church together. So that's how powerful prayer is. We are literally co-laboring, working together with God. So when we pray prayers like, Lord, save my family. Lord, save my grandchildren. Lord, I pray for the city of Columbia that you'll outpour your spirit and give us the drug addicts, the homosexuals, the drunkards. Lord, give us people that are far from you, that they might become near to you, to reach people far from you, that they might become near to you. When we pray those prayers, they move and they break down strongholds in the spiritual realm. It it changes things. That's how powerful prayer is. When the Lord says, go pray with that person that's hurting. You walk up and pray. And the Lord heals them. Wednesday night, all night long, Miss Gift was on my mind. Come to find out, she was on Pastor Ben's mind too. And at the end, after service, we... I just walked back there and I said, are you okay? And and basically she said, I can't hardly, my back is hurting so much I can't sit up. It's hurting. She was crying because it was hurting so bad. And so we just laid hands on her and prayed. And she stood up and she goes, my back's not hurting. Praise God. That means, but that's how God is. That's what he wants to do. That was a weak praise God. Let's praise God. Let's give him a hand clap because he's good. He's a healer. Come on. He invites us to pray. He invites us to pray. God doesn't invite us to pray to keep us busy until he returns. He invites us to pray first to talk with us. Because he loves us and also to exact his will on earth. I once heard that during the Civil War, if you, if you know Civil War history, early on in the Civil War, the Confederacy was actually kind of kicking the Union's butt. Like, number one, all these Yankees didn't know how to shoot a gun, all sorts of stuff, and Johnny Rebel 
he grew up shooting rabbits probably at 150 yards with a muzzle loader, you know, like, he, he, they were just better shots, they were just, all together, just kind of natively better at, I guess, going to war, but what happened was across the north, there became this, this prayer chain, and these northern states would send letters to one another, and they would start praying for the North to win, to restore the Union, and to free the slaves. And the church of the living God prayed, and the tide of the war changed. It changed the course of history. The history. Throughout history. Esther, you go, go read the book of Esther. She's about to walk in before the king. And what does she do? She asks the people to pray and to fast with her. And she walks in because, guess what? The Jews were about to be um, killed by a genocidal maniac. And the people prayed that Esther would have favor. And she walked in before the king. And God completely turned it around. And the very gallows that he built to hang Esther's family on, he was hung and his family was hung on. Because people prayed. Prayer changes things. God doesn't just do it, tell us to do it, to say, oh, just keep them busy. The second thought I want to give you today is God wants to answer. God wants to answer. When I read these scriptures, I'll just go back to a few of them. But when you pray, oh, no, not that one, not that one. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What? Like, Jesus, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, I believe that you received it and it will be yours. What? Ask my Father in my name whatever you wish. And it will be done. Four times in three chapters, he said, ask in my name. Jesus is giving us the power of attorney with unlimited power. It sounds too good to be true. So is your salvation. Everything in the word of God is too good to be true. And we have such a hard time believing these. We have such a hard time believing that God just meant what he meant. We, oh, well, he was using hyperbole. Was he? Like, from my, from my reading of scripture, God doesn't mix words. He doesn't joke around. I'm not saying he doesn't have a sense of humor. He made me. He does have a sense of humor. But he wasn't using hyperbole. He was being dead serious. He didn't say, ask whatever you, in, in my name, ask whatever you want. And our father will do it. And, and, then, and then he's like, just joking. God's not going to listen. No, he reinforces and reinforces and reinforces. But we have a hard time with this. We have whole doctrines of why God doesn't answer prayer. We have, like, there are things that hinder our prayer. We're going to get into that. But I, I think part of it, we just don't believe that he wants to. God wants to answer your prayer. God wants to heal your body. God wants to show up in your finances. God wants to deliver you from affliction. God wants to because he's a good God and he loves you. Everything God does towards us is because he loves you. He makes all things work together for our good according to his power. All things God's word is entirely true. From in the beginning, in Genesis, to the amen in Revelation. There's not one word in between those two words. That is not true. We either believe it in its entirety, the inerrancy, the infallibility of God's word, or we don't. 
We can't pick and choose what we want. We got to take what we don't like and what we like. God's word is completely true. Jesus is who he said he is. Or he's crazy. What did Jesus claim? He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the son of God. What else did he claim? He claimed that on the third day he would raise from the dead. And he did. Jesus did exactly what he said he would do. He did exactly what he said he would do. So Jesus is who he says he was. And Jesus does what he said he'll do. God's word is true. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something real quick. It's in Luke chapter 23, 32 through 33. These scriptures have nothing to do with prayer. I'm just going to preface that. But I'm making a point. This is Luke chapter 23. He says, Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, or Calvary, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right side and one on his left side. Who believes Jesus died between two thieves? Just raise your hand. You believe that, right? You believe that Jesus died between, between two criminals. Why do you believe that? Because the Bible says it, right? You have no other source for that belief. You have no other evidence for that belief. Just because the narrative in Luke chapter 23 says that Jesus was crucified between two thieves. So we just believe it. Like, if, if I were to ask you without reading that, how many of you guys believe that Jesus died between two thieves? Every one of you guys would raise your hand. Why? Because you heard that your whole life. You saw it in the passion of the Christ. And so it has to be true. It's on the internet. You believe it. And the only source for that is in the word of God. The same Bible, I want you to hear this. The same Bible says this in, Ro in Romans chapter 6, 5 and 6. I want you to buckle up for this. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Verse 6. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Verse 7. Romans chapter 6, verse 7. I want you to hear this. The same Bible that says Jesus was crucified between two thieves says in verse 7, For we died with Christ. We were set free. For when we died with Christ. For when we died with Christ. We were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. And he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now he lives. He lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. If I were to ask us before that, how many of you guys died with Christ? We have a harder time. We have a harder time with that one. I don't feel dead. I don't feel dead to sin. I, 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 I still wrestle with it. I, 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 don't, I don't feel like it's easy when it's someone else. It's easy to believe when it was those two criminals that died beside Christ. But the Bible says that we died with Christ. And the same Bible that gives validity to the first gives validity to the second. And we have, we have an obligation to believe both. If the Bible says you died with Christ, you're dead with Christ. If the Bible says you live with Christ, you live with Christ. It doesn't matter how you feel, correct? 
Our feelings will deceive us. The Bible says our heart's filled with all kinds of evil. It 100% will always deceive us. So my point being, we need to believe the word whether we feel it or not. We need to believe the truth and the promises of God whether we feel it or not. You might not feel like praying. You might not feel like God's answering. You might not feel you keep praying. You keep going. You keep seeking. The Bible says, ask, seek, knock. You keep asking. You keep seeking. You keep knocking. You keep asking. You keep seeking. You keep knocking. You keep walking. You keep pressing. You keep praying. You keep praising. You keep worshiping. You keep going. Because God wants to answer your prayer. He says so in his word. And his word is true. We just need to believe it. He says, ask anything in my name. It'll be done. With that said, I would be a horrible pastor to just feed you all this hype. And goodness, it is, it's not just hype, it's good. And not also tell you there are things that hinder our prayer life. Like, I, don't, I want all of us to operate in all the power and all the potential of a faith-filled prayer life. That we pray crazy prayers. That we pray powerful prayers. We pray kingdom-shaping prayers. But there are things that the Word of God lists out that hinders our prayer life. And if you're... Maybe you're here today, and, th- that, and, and I, w- I, want, I want to be very gentle, because some of these are hard. And maybe you're here today, and you've been praying for a long time, and you feel like God's just not answering, God's not showing up, or, or, you know, sometimes God just says no. He's a father. I tell my kids no. They can ask for good things, and I still say no. I want to say yes, but my kids would ask for chocolate for dinner every night, and I have to say, no, your mom's here. I can't do that. But when she's gone, we're going to dive in. No. I love you guys enough to tell you the truth. There are things to hinder us. And and so the the last thought I'm going to leave you with is hindrances to our to the conversation with God. And I want to say this: every one of these hindrances is not on God's end. He never puts anything between us. He moved heaven. He conquered death, hell, and the grave to get to you. He will never put an obstacle between us. We, on the other hand, put obstacles all the time between us. I remember when I was in high school, from fifth grade to 12th grade, I played basketball. I don't know if you guys knew I played basketball. And... Um, I shot. I had a bad shot. No one corrected me. No one. I had, I had four coaches during that time frame, and I shot like this. It was just a horrible form. Shot right off the top of my head. It was a bad form. And when I got to college, Coach Hanson shot, saw me shooting, and, and like I wasn't bad in college or high school. I, I, I scored a lot of points and um, got a lot of rebounds, all that good stuff, and. And I, but I practiced my bad shot so much that it became natural. And, but it wasn't effective. It, it was and it wasn't. There was a more effective way. And so when I got to college, Coach Hansen, he saw me shoot once and he said, come here. Every day after practice, you have to do this for 20 minutes. And he wouldn't let me shoot during practice other than the layups. I had to sit with my hand, behind, my left hand, my weak hand behind my back, and I had to shoot off my eyebrow with my elbow in because I shot like this in high school. I had to shoot. I had, he, over the course of months, every practice, day in and day out, and it was very humbling when you think all athletes think they're the best athlete in the world, and then you get told your, your, your form is broken. And he made me, and still not probably not that good, but he made me work on my form. It was so humbling. Everyone else is going and, 
getting ready to go. I had to stay 20 minutes under the goal and just shooting off my eyebrow with my one hand behind my back constantly until it, my, my form changed. And that's what I hope will happen today as we look at things that hinder our prayer life. And so I'm, I'm just going to throw the list up there for all you note takers. The first thing, this, and this is not an extensive list, this is just common things that hinder our prayer life. Lack of love. Everything that we do is motivated by love. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And when we, and when we have a lack of love, we are praying selfishly. We're not letting the Holy Spirit cultivate in us the mind and the heart of Christ. So we end up praying prayers that don't look like Jesus. We end up praying prayers that Jesus wouldn't pray. The solution is repentance. And letting the Holy Spirit do what he wants in you. And repentance, the solution to a lot of these is repentance. But repentance really is just coming into agreement with God. In the Old Testament, it meant going a new direction. In the New Testament, it means changing the way you think. And it's both. When we truly repent to the Lord, we don't keep doing the physical side of it. We don't keep doing the very thing we need to repent over. So if it's lack of love, we start cultivating, letting the Holy Spirit cultivate love. So we go out of our way to be loving. We let I need to be kind. What, what is love? Love is patient. Love is kind. It, it, you know, like 1 Corinthians 13 says it all. What love is. Love is patient. It's kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It, it goes through all this stuff. So we let the Holy Spirit cultivate these things in us. And, 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 and we repent. We, we change our behavior and we change the way we think to where we don't have to think about it anymore. That's the whole point of repentance is it becomes our nature to be like Jesus because that's what the Holy Spirit wants to cultivate in you is Jesus. The second, mistreatment of our wife. Husbands. I'm just going to read 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. You know, what's so funny is I started going through my message and kind of flushing some of this stuff out last night, and I was irritable. I was, I don't know why I was so annoyed with life in general, but Amy said something to me. I'm like, you go check it. I was... <laughs> And I'm like, I'm literally in the middle of something. And she goes, why are you so angry? And I'm like, I'm working on my message. <laughs> Put my spiritual foot down. I went out there and I laid down and I started praying. And I, I felt like, I literally felt such a wall between me and God. And I knew I was wrong. I like... Like, I always joke that the Holy Spirit won't let me be a hypocrite. I got up, and I'm pretty sure she was, she probably didn't even get a second thought. She was already asleep. Like, 9.30 rolls around, and Amy is a stone. She's just, like, she has the body of a 20-year-old and a sleeping pattern of a 90-year-old. It's, it's something. Um, but I got up, and I said, Ames, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. I, I, I'm, I was, I've been irritable all day today, and I'm so sorry. And, um, and I just asked for forgiveness. I repented to her. And I tell you what, I went back out and laid in our living room, and I just based myself before the Lord, and then I felt the presence of God. Like, like it was so crazy, and I wasn't even to, to fleshing this stuff out yet. And I was like, wow, wow, God's word is true. Husbands, treat your wife the way you should. And I think part of this is because the Bible says that we are to love our wives as Christ the church. And when we mistreat our wife, it's not representing Christ well. 
And God's not gonna God's not gonna hear people that don't represent that claim to represent Christ. Pride. The third thing is pride. Pride will hinder your prayers. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Then Peter says, there, or James says it too, therefore humble yourselves under God's mighty right hand. Humble yourself. The solution is humble yourself by repenting. Come into agreement with God. Don't be so proud that you can't go to God. Don't be so proud that you can't go to people. Pride. Unforgiveness. This is serious. This is really serious. This is so serious that God says before we go and offer him praise, that we we need to stop what we're doing and go and make things right with the person that we're harboring unforgiveness towards. Because God doesn't even want our praise and worship if if we're holding on to unforgiveness. It's also serious because another thing is you can't be forgiven unless you forgive. This is serious, and it will literally hinder your prayer life. You go to God, and you're holding on to unforgiveness. Like God's not hearing you. The only prayer he's probably hearing is, God, I'm sorry. And, and here's the thing with forgiveness. We are not God. We cannot forgive and forget. We can't do it. So when we choose to forgive, it so often looks like this, God I forgive them because you've forgiven me. And I just release this to you. And then five minutes later, you have one of those thoughts that you want to hit them with a car or something. I don't know. I've never had those thoughts. It's been hit them with a truck. Um, Oh, come on, Ryan. It's just joking. I mean, not not a pickup truck, like a semi truck. Uh, And then you have to say, no, 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 no. I bind that thought in the name of Jesus. God, I forgive them. You've forgiven me so I can forgive them. God's forgiveness is empowering. God's grace is empowering. It empowers us to forgive. If you knew what God forgave you of, like, well, I've only ever told lies. It was enough to send you to hell. God hates a lying tongue. So I'm telling you. If you knew what God forgave you of, you would be like, oh, God, I forgive them. Oh, you poured so much grace on me, Lord. Help me to pour it on them. I speak blessing over them. And then suddenly you just start praying. And then two minutes later, you have that thought, oh, God, I forgive them. And over time, here pretty soon, you know, maybe a month, a week, I don't know how long it takes, but you consistently say, God, I forgive them because you've forgiven me. Here pretty soon you're going, to have a, you're going to think about that person and not have one ill thought towards them. And you're going to realize forgiveness has taken root. I've truly forgiven them. I don't have any ill will towards them. That's how forgiveness works, but it's not a one and done thing. It's a process. So, but unforgiveness will hinder our prayer life. Unbelief and doubt. We kind of hit on this earlier, but unbelief and doubt is a big deal. We need to believe what God said is true. If we're going to God, it, it's, it's, doubt is the opposite of faith. Like, and God calls us to walk by faith, not by sight. And the enemy wants us to doubt. He wants us to doubt God's goodness. He wants us to doubt God's word. He wants us to doubt um, that God will see us through. He wants us to doubt everything good about God. He wants us to doubt. He doesn't want us to believe. That God's going to come through this time too. And, and, and that's where we have to just stand in faith. Like faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. I once heard it put this way. Faith is believing what you pray for will actually happen. You pray with such confidence, such hope that, man, I know that when I get done praying, God is going to answer That's what God tells us to do. If you believe and don't doubt, ask anything and it will be yours. But the enemy comes at us and, and, and there's nothing wrong. If, you, if you're struggling with belief, if you're wrestling with this, this, this is too good to be true. In, in, in the world, 
every, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. But with God, everything's too good to be true, and it's still true. And so we've got to filter everything through the word of God, and we have to choose to rest in what his word says. That's how we overcome doubt. I'm going to rest in the promises of God, regardless of how things look, regardless of how. I'm going to put my faith in God's word over circumstance. I'm going to put my faith in who he is over how I feel. I'm going to let my faith overcome this doubt. There's a, there's a father that Jesus was addressing, and, and his little girl just died. And Jesus turned and said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. And he said, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's possible to believe and have unbelief. So just turn it over to God. God, I'm going to rest in you. I believe, but help my unbelief. Disobedience. If you are... If you are being disobedient to God's instruction, this is not like sin. It can be sin, but I'm like I'm not talking like unconfessed sin. I'm not talking like um, you're shacking up with someone or doing drugs or dealing drugs or whatever. I'm talking like the Lord told you to go witness to your neighbor. The Lord told you to pray for that person, and you are being disobedient. The Lord told you to respond, whatever, and you're being disobedient. The Lord told you to start something. Maybe, I, I don't know, the Lord told you to take a step of faith and you're not doing it. You're still a Christian, but you're being disobedient. That will hinder your prayer life. That will. It limits us. It limits our faith. It, limit, it limits everything about us. I mean, just think about it. When my children disobey me, I... I discipline them, so I literally put them in the corner or, or send them to time out, and they're limited to what they can do because they're being disobedient. And I don't want to hear them until they say, I'm sorry. And so the beautiful thing is, if we repent and say, okay, God, I agree with you, I'm going to do what you told me to do, even if it costs me, I'm going to be obedient. Another thing, unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. This is a big deal. This will hinder your prayer life. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you about over unconfessed sin, then we must confess it to him and repent. But I want, I want us to hear this, though. We must make the distinction between shame and conviction. Because Satan likes to sneak in here at this point in our walk with God. And he likes to take and make people feel ashamed. And, and then with shame, and it sounds like conviction. It feels kind of like conviction. You feel guilt, right? But then you feel condemned and there's no hope. Oh, I'm, I'm so bad. But shame is guilt and condemnation is guilt over confessed sin. Conviction, the Holy Spirit convicts us to make us feel guilty over unconfessed sin. So the Lord's convicting you. He's making you feel guilty. He's making you feel that sorrow in your soul to get us to come to him and to give him the very thing that he died for so that we can have joy in life. The Bible says godly sorrow produces life and joy. So we need to confess our sin. This will hinder our prayer life. Religion and idolatry. This is working out of our own ability. If you're working out of your own ability, if you think you can manipulate God, you think you can to, to play the system, you think you don't need God and you're, you're praying, but you're, you're, pray, you're, you're relying on yourself over God, you're making yourself an idol, this will hinder your prayer life. Our entire existence relies on who he is and what he did. So we need to repent and understand that Jesus is more than enough. 
And this last one, James tells us, you know, we, we pray in Jesus' name, but if we pray outside the will of God, God won't answer it. It'll, it'll, it'll stifle our prayers. Well, what, what is, I'll give you a quick example, but, it, I mean, this is a hypothetical example, but if, if a couple is dating or engaged and they're contemplating about buying a house and moving in together before marriage, and they're praying like, God, should we do this? The answer is no, you shouldn't. That's outside the will of God. That's outside the order of God for relationship. The, it, it's wrong. And God's not going to honor that when we pray outside the will of God. God's will is so good that Romans 8.28 says, He makes all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. He makes all things work together for good. So we got to rest in his will. I think sometimes I pray. I'm, I'm so thankful for all the prayers God didn't answer because I prayed outside the will of God. I, I heard something this week, and, it, and you know, I, the Bible says in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit prays through us the, the exact will of God for our life. So when we pray in tongues, it's the Holy Spirit praying through us to God. And that's beautiful. He's using our tongue, but he's praying the exact will of God for our lives. Sometimes we don't know how to pray. Like, I don't know. And I, I know there, there are times where I've like, I prayed for something like, God, I really, like last year, we prayed for three or four, four houses that we put offers in. And we're like, God, please let us get this house. Let us get this house. And then we go to our own private prayer time when we start praying in the spirit and praying in tongues. And I know what the Holy Spirit was probably doing in my prayer time was he's, he's saying, God, I know all those times, all those prayers that they prayed for that house, I want you to ignore that. Because if you did that, they won't be able to supply the needs for their family. So, Lord, I pray. You know, like, he, he, he prays the exact will of God. There are times where I've like, oh, this is God's will. Lord, give us this house. But man, it would have increased our monthly payment by like $500. And God's like, I love you too much. And the Holy Spirit's like, I love you too much. I want to just cancel that guy out. Um, <laughs> we're going to ignore that one. Um, Father, you get, get and, and, and that, that's the beauty. That's the beauty. And, but when we consistently pray outside the will of God and the heart of God, it hinders our prayer life. But the good news is, God wants to answer. And it starts with the prayer of repentance. Saying, God, I agree with you. I agree with you. God, you're right. I'm wrong. That's what repentance looks like. And then... You do what he says. You follow him. It's really that simple. You come into agreement with what God says. How I want to end today. I want to end today with prayer. But I want, I want us to search our hearts like, Lord, are there things in my life that are hindering, hindering my connection with you? Because God, God, he never violates free will. He loves you too much to violate your will. And if you ask him, he'll come alongside you and co-labor in prayer and move those things out of the way because he wants to answer your prayers. He invites us to converse. But these things that we just listed at the end, can you throw them up one more time? Those things get us out of tune with him. 
that, that get us out of frequency with him. Not only does it hinder his ability to answer, it's not doesn't hinder his ability to answer, but it hinders our, our ability to communicate with him, but it, it, it hinders our ability to hear from him. The thing is, the Lord is always speaking. He's always speaking. And, and, and so what, what I want to do today is I, wa- I want us to just take time and say, Lord, are there things in my life that, that come, come in between us that might hinder my prayer life? Because we have got to be a praying church, and we are a praying church, but we got to be praying big prayers. we got to be praying earth, uh, kingdom-shaping prayers. we got to be praying stronghold-tearing-down prayers. we got to come against the kingdom of darkness we got to lift up the name of Jesus. we got to point people to God Almighty. And, and it starts with going after him and being in tune with him and doing what he wants us to do. And it's hard to do what he wants us to do if we can't hear him. And these things really muffle our ability to hear him. And I'm not trying to to step on anyone's toes. I'm not trying to make anyone mad. I I love you so much. Jesus is coming back, and we got to be serious about the kingdom. And I want us to be serious about our prayer life. I want us to be serious. Man, the church in the United States has, uh, the average Christian prays less than 90 seconds a day. That's not kingdom-shaping prayers. Let's go before God. He, He says that, we can come because of Jesus we can come into the throne of God's room boldly we can come into the presence of God boldly I want you to understand how serious this is that we can enter the presence of God boldly did you know that in the Old Testament if a priest entered the presence of God and didn't confess their sins they would fall dead They would fall dead in the presence because the presence of God is nothing to be uh, messed around with. He's God. But because of Jesus, he makes us sons and daughters and he says, come on, my kids. Come in here with your mess. I want you. We can walk in boldness because of Jesus. And today I ask that as we worship as we praise, as we come before God boldly. Let's say, God, search me. Search me. Lord, I confess. I come into agreement with you. You're right and I'm wrong. I repent. Let's walk out of here and let our prayer lives be more powerful because of the Holy Spirit. Let our prayer lives shape the course of the kingdom of God in Columbia and Spring Hill and Kolioka and Santa Fe and the surrounding communities. Let our prayer lives raise the dead. Let our prayer lives heal the sick. Let our prayer lives break the bondage of the enemy. Because we serve a big God that he wants to. Let our prayer lives see our children and our grandchildren come into relationship with the God who loves them. Let's stand. And as they lead, I'll be down here for prayer if you need prayer. But I want us to take time to soul search and come before the Lord. I can't do that for you. I'm not going to lead you in a corporate prayer. This is between you and the Most High. And let me tell you, He's in love with you. He's saying, oh, I can't wait for this conversation. I can't wait to talk to my kids. I love them so much. I'll be down here if you need prayer. But let's go before the Lord as as this team leads. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Declaring there is 
is hope and there is freedom, our sweet Jesus. It's your name. It's your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through. God, I pray right now that you would be with your people, God, as they go out and live their daily lives, Lord, that their prayers that they pray this week, 
that every one of them will be answered. The prayers that they've been praying, God. Lord, we trust that that you are so good and that you are so faithful. And so, God, I pray that you would begin to answer prayers this week, Lord. That next week when we come back together, we will have so many testimonies of the things that you've done throughout the week, God, because we are trying to be obedient to where you are calling us and repentance, Lord. God, I pray right now that you would be with every single one of your people today, God, those watching online, those that are in here in person, God, that you would be with them, Lord, that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them, that they would take hold of the things that the enemy is saying over them and that they would speak life into their situations this week, Lord. We thank you and we praise you for what you're going to do, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.